Thank you, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it is an enormous pleasure to host this event today. Um, and before we get underway, I also want to thank uh, Saks Fifth Avenue. The uh, largesse of, the, of, of Saks has really made events like this possible. So thank you. OK. Globally, there are approximately 1 million suicide deaths each year. And in the United States alone, there are about 46 to 47,000 suicide deaths. Said differently, there are about one suicide death every 11 to 12 minutes, which is to say by the time we are done today, <clears throat> over the course of the next two hours, about 12 people would have taken their lives with their own hands. We now live in a technology revolution. Uh, smartphones, which used to be simple flip phones, now are like supercomputers in our pocket. And we, now, we now need to start thinking outside the box to the extent to which we could utilize innovative technologies to improve early detection, prevention, and potentially the delivery of treatment. About 15 years ago, a term was popularized, this term digital phenotyping. More traditionally, digital phenotyping meant very simply trying to understand dynamic changes in affect and behavior, but done so through something known as experience sampling or ecological momentary assessment, which is to say that at several points throughout the course of the day, uh, individuals were completing surveys that were delivered to their smartphones to report on how they're feeling, how they're behaving, who they're spending time with, are they experiencing suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And this work now, you know, 15 to 20 years in, has provided enormous insights, particularly as it relates to the transition from ideation to action. But as you could imagine, although instrumental in this understanding, it can be quite burdensome for individuals to continually participate in completing these surveys, particularly when you're following them for longer and longer durations. As the technology has advanced, we now have the capacity to start to understand different metrics that are being uh, actively and unobtrusively captured in one's phone. For example, looking at geolocation data, we know where people are spending their time, how they may be spending that time, differences as it relates from day to day. We could track what they're writing into their phone and extract different metrics that may relate to how they're feeling on a given day, um, the, the speed with which they're spending, uh, sending their messages in terms of kind of potential agitation. And so what we're starting to now paint a picture of is that we're using these passive approaches to collect data through things like geolocation, keystrokes, and even accelerometry data that allow us to model things like sleep in an adolescent's life, capturing how long they've been asleep, sleep onset and sleep offset. You could start now using these complementary approaches to better understand the rise and fall and cadence of an adolescent's life. We started doing this research about 10 to 12 years ago, and one of the first challenges we faced was simply going to be, is this work feasible in the context of an adolescent population? Meaning, would they allow us to install an app on their smartphones to allow us to track what's going on? But also, kind of more logistically, what are the appropriate use cases in which you could begin to do this type of work? One area that we started was in the context of depression. As many in the audience may know, approximately 20% of adolescents will experience a depressive episode by the time they're age 18. 85% of these individuals will experience a recurrent episode within just five years of their initial diagnosis, suggesting that most of these individuals are gonna have many recurrent episodes in the context of their life. Part of this is born from the fact that many of these individuals, even while out of episode, continue to experience distressing symptoms that persist. And what we wanted to better understand is can we utilize mobile technology to better capture symptoms or behaviors that may be manifesting or even percolating up as depressive symptoms to potentially, if it were to arise, to connect and bridge them to clinical care earlier in the disease course to potentially eliminate some of that distress. One area that we started was, was, was comparing healthy and otherwise remitted depressed individuals, and we were looking simply at their geolocation patterns, so their mobility metrics, using the GPS data that, again, is just passively being collected in youth smartphones. And one of the ideas here is that we saw in the literature 
that many depressed individuals who are in a remitted state continued to experience persistent behavioral symptoms, meaning there was, there was greater lethargy, greater anhedonia, uh, less uh, willingness and uh, um, uh, motivation to engage with their other peers. And what I'm showing you here in this figure is we're looking at circadian routine. Circadian routine is not circadian rhythm. Circadian routine is looking at the regularity of one's day, the idea being that as somebody becomes more depressed, they start to decompensate, their schedule becomes less regular. And what we're showing you here uh, using GPS data, we can ca capture is an individual spending you know, time in the same place around the same time generally each day with one being kind of absolute rigidity and zero being absence thereof. And we see that even comparing these healthy and remitted depressed individuals, that the remitted depressed folks are actually showing reduced circadian routine or less structure in their days. We're also seeing that they're actually moving around the world less than their healthy counterparts, perhaps exhibiting less effort or motivation to uh, approach the world. And even when you start to track this over the course of 21 days, this was a small proof of concept sample uh, uh, study. And we're seeing that even over the course of these 21 days that the remitted depressed group shown here in blue is moving around less on most, but certainly not all days. And this effect persists even when you account for their current depressive state. And so this gave us a lot of motivation that we could start to pull metrics that are naturalistically collected from smartphones to start to distinguish risk states, particularly among high-risk individuals. And one area that was particularly compelling to us was potentially leveraging what adolescents write in their phone. For those of you who have adolescents or who work with adolescents, many of these individuals are sending thousands of messages a day. And we could start to harness this data to start to pull out information that may presage different risk. So for example, we could use a variety of different natural language processing approaches and extract out the sentiment of a given message at the level of a message or across the day, and potentially allowing us to chart these affective dynamics that may precede uh, important risk states. You could also pull out other linguistic markers. So we know that depressed and suicidal individuals tend to engage in this pattern of all or nothing thinking, so that there may be a greater presence of absolutist language, like all or nothing, always and never. And there's also a rich literature showing that how greater proportional use of personal pronouns uh, is indicative of a ruminative state, so this tendency to perseverate about one's depressive thinking. But also, research based on the psychotherapy literature has shown that greater proportional use of personal pronouns in the context of therapy actually predicts suicide death among some high-risk patients. So these ideas and, and prior findings started to motivate a recently completed study, the Mobile Assessment for the Prediction of Suicide, or MAPS, as it was known within our group. MAPS was built on this premise that there's this what-when paradox. Increasingly, we know what risk factors may be important for youth suicide, but that doesn't necessarily help us understand when that risk is greatest. In the context of this multi-site study, we had the great fortune of partnering with the University of Pittsburgh and David Brent's wonderful team. This is a project that I led with Nick Allen, who's a wonderful collaborator at the University of Oregon. And what we did in the context of this study is that we recruited high-risk suicidal youth. We installed an app on their smartphone known as the Effortless Assessment Research System, or EARS. And this allowed us to seamlessly collect active data, so experience sampling data, which we're actively asking individuals about their mood, occurrence of suicidal thoughts and behaviors, while at the same time unobtrusively scraping the mobile sensing data in the background. So specifically, the keyboard inputs, accelerometry data, and geolocation data. Now, this was uh, kind of the holy grail of studies from our perspective, because if we are successful in doing so, if we are able to predict when that risk is greatest in real time, it would allow us to seamlessly use this technology to develop just-in-time interventions. Just-in-time interventions identify when somebody is at that great risk, but also concurrently allows us to intervene and potentially provide the wraparound care that an individual needs to potentially save lives. In one of the first papers to emerge from this project, we were focusing on the active assessment. So in the context of the study, we're following these high-risk individuals over the course of six months. We're collecting daily mood over the course of every single day. So what I'm showing you here in this relatively busy plot are the individual level data of our participants for about the first hundred or so individuals who enrolled in the study. 
We have our daily mood on the y-axis. We have time on x uh, and days on the x-axis. And again, on average, these are approximations. An individual is enrolled in the study for about 180 days. We recruited three different groups of individuals. Our extremely high-risk individuals are shown here in pink. These are recent attempters. Att they made an attempt in the past year and are currently ideating. We also recruited ideators, shown here in green, without any history of an attempt, as well as um, uh, youth with no history of suicidal thoughts and behaviors, but are presenting with a mood, anxiety, or substance use disorder. The idea here is that we wanted to capture both the emergence of suicidal thoughts and behavior, as well as factors that facilitate the transition from, su from suicidal ideation to action. In addition to capturing mood every day once a week, we were also capturing the intensity of their suicidal thoughts. They, a they answered a question sent to their phone every Wednesday, how intense are your thoughts of killing yourself on a scale from one to five, where four was believed to be a threshold where an individual is at clinically significant ideation such that a licensed clinician would follow up with an individual uh, and, and conduct a safety risk. And if there was risk, we would then necessarily bridge them to clinical services. What we then did was we essentially took these daily mood ratings and created weekly averages or aggregates that time locked to those weekly assessments of suicidal thinking. And what we found was that a one standard deviation drop in one's mood on a given week resulted in a threefold greater likelihood that they'd be reporting clinically significant ideation. Again, the level of ideation that required a licensed individual to follow up with these teens. Now you may be saying, well, it's not particularly novel to link uh, low mood to suicidal ideation and otherwise high-risk individuals, and you'd be absolutely right. But the challenge we face in the clinical field is that we're perpetually meeting with patients who are depressed and chronically suicidal, so when do you intervene? And research like this tells us at an individual level that there are specific thresholds for which they may truly benefit from ha having that wraparound care. That you can't provide a weekly follow-up assessment with every kid at every time, but when there are certain thresholds that are crossed, it's clinically indicated that it may be beneficial to follow up. Now these were f promising findings, but the challenge, as I alluded to earlier in the presentation, is that the more you ask of a participant, particularly over the course of six months, the less they give you. So it turns out in the study, although we had relatively compliant participants, you know, so we're assessing them over the course of, uh, on average, 180 days, we're getting feedback from them via surveys for about half or 90 days, which is a lot better than getting none, which is what they're getting in the wild when they're clinical patients. But we're also unobtrusively collecting this mobile sensing data in the background. And what I'm showing you here uh, is a figure from data collected both at Columbia and Pittsburgh. These are ordered and measured in pink and missing in blue. And these are ordered such that there's most missing on top uh, to most measured uh, down below. And what this shows is, are, are the days. So days are on the x-axis, the participants are on the y-axis. These are the days in which data were uploaded from the mobile sensor data. And it turns out that when you drop the 10% the, the of individuals who provided you know, very little data, or when you, when you drop data from the individuals who provided less than 10% of the data, you're essentially getting 83% of the data just from the mobile sensing meeting. On 83% of the days, you're actually getting the mobile sensor data from these individuals compared to only 50%. So what this led us to believe then is, could we ostensibly create metrics that mirror or become proxies or surrogates for daily mood ratings? So we wouldn't have to explicitly ask individuals how they're feeling every day. And one area that we thought was potentially promising was just using what they're naturistically typing in your phone. If you reflect on your own lives, the good days and the bad days, one could probably glean just from reading your messages whether it was, in fact, a good or bad day. And we use that philosophy to really uh, motivate these hypotheses. And so we took a subsample of this group over the course of 90 days and did natural language processing on all messages collected uh, over the course of the 90 day. And it turns out that what we are naturistically typing in our phone, when you extract out that sentiment using uh, natural language processing approaches, is a reliable and robust predictor of your next day mood, even when controlling for the prior day mood. And you could even pull out topics of words. So for example, shown here, laughter-related words are inversely related to depressive symptoms, uh, disagreement-related words are, are positively associated with dysphoric symptoms, and even clusters of emojis can predict uh, next day uh, mood. And so this gave us enormous hope that you could start to pull out metrics and not rely on their active input. And so what we then did was we revisited those analyses where we're using natural language processing instead of their mood. So pulling out just sentiment on the week prior to those assessments of, of suicidal ideation and reran the analyses. And just looking at the, uh, 
the one week blocks, we found that, oops, I think we're stuck, our, oh, there we go. Uh, that a one standard deviation drop in your sentiment, so a reduction in your sentiment on a given week actually predicted clinically significant ideation uh, risk states. Again, the level of ideation that required a licensed individual to follow up with a team. But it's not all about predicting ideation. We're also particularly interested in predicting events. And so again, we're going back to these mobility data and seeing kind of what truths that this could unveil to us. And so in the context of this six-month study, we know exactly when an event occurred. So for example, we know if a suicide attempt occurred on, every, on a given date, and we could look at mobility patterns over the course of those seven days and compare it to every other seven-day period over the course of the study. And similarly, we could look at other more broad events like emergency department visits or psychiatric hospitalizations. And our goal here was to determine whether, based on pattern of mobility, can we predict a suicide event within a week. And one area that we wanted to focus on was homestay the proportional amount of time that somebody was spending at home. In our data, and as well as some of our collaborators around the country, we show that a greater homestay is uh, strongly related and robustly associated with depression symptoms or even a depressive diagnosis. And what we wanted to look at, again, dynamically over the course of this six-month study is how changes in homestay, so greater homestay, may be indicative of a suicide event one week later. And we thought that this was important because uh, social isolation and loneliness may be indicative of a greater acute state, such that if individuals are spending more time at home, maybe they're cutting themselves off from their peers, their communities, or even saying goodbye. And what we found here was, again, that a one standard deviation increase in the homestay on a given week predicted the greater likelihood by a factor of twofold in the subsequent week. Re studies like that can tell us when somebody's at risk and potentially will allow us to start to develop just-in-time interventions, but we're equally committed to partner to better determine whether we could start to utilize some of these metrics to increase the value of our psychiatric delivery and psychiatric uh, outpatient care. And so we've had the great fortune over the past year to partner with Dr. Colleen Cullen and Zach Blumkin in starting, in starting to develop a clinical tool that could be used in clinical settings to actively harness some of the passive metrics that we're collecting. So using sentiment analyses from keyboard inputs as an indicator of mood on a given day, accelerometry data in the context of, of measuring sleep on a given day, and even GPS patterns to look at changes in homestay as well as just general movement. And what we're working on is developing a dashboard that a clinician in real time can look at the level of the day to look at changes in a patient's states. So looking at changes in sentiment, changes in sleep, and then utilizing these objective data to really push treatment forward faster. But the exciting thing about this approach is because the app is already built in, in session, patients can, in collaboration with their therapist, develop different tools that they want to be delivered to their phone. One of the challenges with patients is that they may not truly recognize when they should begin to utilize different tools or how to utilize these tools. So at certain thresholds, nudges can be automatically delivered to the patient to remind them and encourage them to apply and utilize these different tools in real time. And we're testing within the intensive outpatient program that is a DBT setting, whether integration of these digitally assisted psychiatric tools will help improve uh, the outcomes for the treatment itself. So in closing, I presented a lot of information that may feel a little pie in the sky, but I think that we're at a point now, given the level and depth of this crisis, that we really do need to think outside the box. I think that we have, in a really short time, made great stride in trying to understand risk. We're collecting data that really and ostensibly has very little to do with suicide, accelerometry data, GPS, what you're writing in your phone, and we're developing algorithms that are actually in somewhat reliably telling us when a depressive state is present, when a suicide event may occur. And I think that we're really just at the beginning in terms of uh, deploying this and really, uh, really understanding the true value. We're trying to deploy this in the context of outpatient programs, primary care, and schools to really understand the reproducibility of some of these algorithms that we're developing. We're concurrently testing and developing just-in-time interventions. What will work when somebody is at risk is a separable question to identifying when that risk is greatest. And of course, trying to partner with, our, with, our, with the clinicians within the Columbia system to, to determine whether we could utilize some of these metrics to really improve clinical care. 
So I will end by saying you know, thank you to all the collaborators, some of which are in the room. Thank you for your time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations today.